Hi everyone, I'm Tova with Professor Pincushion and today we're doing a live stream. Now I haven't done very many live streams before. I prefer to practice and be able to record my stuff without the privacy or without having an audience. So I'm a little nervous about answering questions in front of everybody and I'm not gonna promise that I can answer everybody's question and if I ask it, um, I might ask um, for you to actually put it into our forum on the website because then it gives me a little bit more of a chance to think over some of the questions a little bit better. But I'm not a stranger to answering questions, all kinds of sewing questions. Before I did this, when I was in college, I worked at a fabric store for a few years and during this time of year, people would come in and they would be, I've never sewn before, I'm making my first Halloween costume, I have no idea what I'm doing, and so I would have to help them with their costumes and everything like that. So I've definitely heard all kinds of crazy questions and we can try to work this out together. If you actually have an opinion where you think you can answer somebody's question that they have, definitely feel free to put it into our comments and help them out. First question though that I have of you, can everybody hear me okay? So you can just, Put a little thing in the chat saying yes the audio is good or if we need to bump it up just let us know and then i can have my assistant here do that for me okay so i i have i can hear you loud and clear and then no so i don't know that means you can't hear me at all or it's too low okay so i have a couple audios great so we're gonna go ahead and move ahead on a question so if you do have a question you can put it in the chat. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. We did allow people to put in questions ahead of time. So I might just go back and forth between those questions and then the ones that are in the live chat. So I'm gonna start with the first question here from Coffee Gypsy. And she says, I love dresses and skirts made from good knit material. However, I can't seem to prevent the hems from curling. Is a cover stitch machine hem the key or what can I do to stop this from happening? Now with knit material, it seems to be a foe with a lot of people and it really depends on the type of knit that you use because there are all different types of knit. I mean, that's just one category. You either have woven fabric or you have knit fabric and within the category of knit fabric, there's all different types of variations and stuff. The type of knit fabric that people seem to have the most problem with is probably going to be Jersey just because it tends to curl and it's lightweight and sometimes the machines don't actually like working with it. So that seems, I'm gonna guess that's probably the type of fabric that uh, Coffee Gypsy is using. Now, as far as the hem curling, she doesn't say whether it's before when she's just trying to work with it and the fabric is curling or it's happening after it's already hemmed, but I'll just deal with both issues. So if you create your hem and then your fabric or the knit is curling, it usually with this type of fabric, what it means is there's not enough stabilization. So your fabric is so lightweight that it's just the gravity or the type of fabric it is, is causing it to curl. And even after you sew it, it's still not cooperating. So what you can do in order to stabilize that area is you can get a lightweight Trico interfacing. So this is gonna be a fusible interfacing and it's this really stretchy interfacing and it's lightweight. You can just apply it to the bottom of the hemline before you do that hem just to give it a little bit of stabilization and that should probably help it um, after you sew it so it's not gonna curl as much. Now, if you're dealing with this type of fabric and you're not even sewing with it but you're just trying to pin with it or work with it or iron it and the fabric is curling on you, which I know is extremely annoying, um, you can use, if it is washable, use spray starch. And it's spray starch, it's like the magical chemical of, of sewers. So you spray it onto your fabric and you press it and it'll cause the fabric to lie flat and so it'll make it easier for you to pin it um, and be able to sew with it a lot easier. Now, once you finish doing your seam or your hem or whatever, then you can wash it out and then it could just be normal fabric, so you don't have to worry about it staying stiff. Now, obviously, if you're using fabric that cannot be washable, you probably don't want to use spray starch. And in cases like um, that, you probably just want to have it attached or pinned to tissue paper because that also acts as a stabilizer. And then after you finish sewing, you can rip the tissue paper off. So that definitely makes it a lot easier to work with those more difficult fabrics. Um, but yeah, that's what I would recommend for that type. So let's see. So 
Lillian wants to know, is it wise to sew a boning in a bodice made of illusion tool? Now, tool is a really tricky fabric to work with just because it does tend to be very delicate. And if you know if you've worked with tool, if you get one little snip, it's really easy to rip it. So you definitely have to be careful. I'm not saying you can't um, use boning, um, but probably it's probably not going to work as well as you think because tool doesn't have any stabilization. So it's probably going to do whatever the boning wants it to do. So I, I probably would be really careful with that. Um, also, you're going to be able to see the boning through the tool. I don't know how many layers. And I see that you actually left another comment. How many layers of tool and netting for the construction of a bodice will be later and covered in decoration. So I see it's kind of related to that. So I'm imagining you're probably doing a sweetheart bodice and because you, all your support is in the boning. Oh, wow. So that is probably going to be a little bit more difficult. And also with tool and netting, usually it's not just because it's see-through, but it's not really a comfortable fabric to wear with. That's why you're normally going to have some lining behind that. Um, so I would probably say you're probably going to want to have at least a couple of layers of tulle. You might even want to have some lining under that so it's more comfortable for the person to wear underneath. But the problem is, is that you're going to have to think about um, what's going to keep that up if it's just going to be the bony or the tool's just going to kind of play weird at the top. I don't know what that's going to look like. If I were you, I'd probably, I mean, if you just go to your local fabric store and buy some cheap netting, you could probably kind of experiment on your own, but I don't know if it's gonna have that nice clean line at the top if you are doing that sweetheart bodice type look. I think that's gonna make it a little bit more difficult. And then if you do a lining, it kind of ruins, I don't know if you're doing tool because you want it to be see-through, but then if you do a lining because you want it to be comfortable, it's going to kind of ruin that anyway. So I don't really know what kind of a look you're trying to go for. So you might want to just put that in the form with maybe an image of what you're trying to recreate. And then I could kind of look at it a little bit more in depth and give kind of a better answer for you because that's a little bit difficult since I don't know what you're trying to create here. All right, next question is from Sage. Um, she wants, well, her main question is, how to ensure quality fabrics when purchasing online without purchasing swatches. I find swatches to be a waste of money and time and the fabric's gone by the time I get swatches. Now, like I said, I have worked at a fabric store for about three years, but I was in a br br uh, brick and mortar store. So I really didn't deal with any of the online part of it. So I know it's really difficult in order to purchase fabric strictly through online and I've definitely done it myself and I've gotten swatches before. So waiting for the swatches and then once you get the swatches, it's usually like this little tiny piece and you're not sure what you're going to do. Getting good quality fabric, especially online, is you're going to want to make sure that you're reading the reviews of those particular fabric stores. So you're not just, I mean, there's gonna be a difference if you're going to cheapfabrics.com as opposed to mood fabrics. One of them is gonna have better quality fabrics and you're definitely going to pay a lot more for certain types. Now, the most important thing, at least with all fabric stores, is checking their return policy. A lot of people don't know. A lot of fabric stores do offer you can return fabrics after you purchase them. So if you're just, really afraid that the fabric that you want to get is not going to be available by the time you get the swatch and then you make your decision on what you want to do, you can go ahead, if you check the return policy, buy your fabric from them before you even get your swatch. Now, if you get your fabric, let's say you get five yards of fabric and decide, I don't want it, you can usually return that fabric even to Joann's or to an online fabric store as long as you have not cut that fabric up. Now, I'm not saying all stores are like that. That's why you need to check. But if you don't cut up their fabric, and it's the same thing with patterns. If you just purchase a new pattern and you're deciding, no, I don't want this pattern, as long as you haven't cut it up, they will allow you to return it. So that kind of gives you a little bit more leeway where maybe you can take a chance, if they allow it, buy that five yards. If you decide it's not going to work, then you can return it if you don't want to use it without taking the risk that they're not going to have it if you really want it. 
Another fabric option, which I, th I don't think a lot of people think of, is actually buying from the smaller boutique type fabrics, which you can find on places like Etsy. I've actually found a lot of cool fabrics and trims and stuff that you don't normally see in other fabric stores, like the huge chain stores. And with that, you're dealing more with an, a smaller company or individual person where you can ask questions and perhaps, you know, have messages back and forth saying, this is what I want to do. What do you think would be the best fabric for that? And what's your quality of fabric and stuff? So I think you're always gonna take a risk when it's online stuff, but at least with Etsy or online stores, you can check the reviews and see if people are normally happy with them. But you're obviously not gonna know what you have until you get it. And I'm not saying don't do swatches because swatches are a good idea if you do have that luxury to do it. All right, let's see what we have here. Um, let's do cat lever, one, two, three. Do you use a serger and is it necessary for some projects or can you get away um, doing everything with a sewing machine. So I have a sewing machine. Well, I have, I have several sewing machines. I do have a serger and I have to say, um, because I haven't had my serger as long as my, I've had my sewing machine, I'm definitely more comfortable using the sewing machine because I've used my sewing machine since I've been in high school and I've only had my serger for the last couple of years. I would say you can probably do pretty much everything with a sewing machine. Um, the serger is definitely nice when you want to have that nice professional look with the overlock stitch and all that kind of stuff. So if you really wanted to go gun ho with making your own um, garments and stuff or, and to sell them and for people not to know your stuff is homemade, definitely want to get a serger. And it's great because it not only does the seam, but it also finishes the edge. So it just looks really nice. With doing the sewing machine, your stuff can also look really nice and not necessarily handmade, but you definitely have to go more the route of doing upscale clothing where you're using bound edges and trying to uh, do a lining so people can't necessarily see all the finishing inside and you can just have it look as nice as possible. But I would definitely say that you can do stuff with your sewing machine and you can do stuff with the serger and there's benefits to both of them, but it's not like you would definitely need both of them in order to make the majority of the things that you want to make. So I'm next going to answer the question. Uh, Lori Ebner wants to know, can I take my dress pants to reflect today's styles? Not skinny, but tapered. You can definitely do whatever alterations you want. If you want to experiment, that's fine. Um, usually when it comes to doing alterations, you want to have a friend help you. It's definitely difficult to do it on your own. I'm not saying you can't do it on your own. It's just really difficult to do it. And I've definitely taken in my own pants to change the style because I wanted them to be more skinny and not so baggy. And I had to enlist my handy assistant over here to help me do it. Now, when I do it, there's different ways to do it, but this is how I like to do it. Because your pants, hopefully, you're taking something that already fits, is already fitted in your waistline and your hips. I turn my pants inside out and then I put them on. So it doesn't matter if I have to zip them up or anything like that. It's inside out, I just do the best I can. Then I have my friend just do one leg, put in the pins for me and I'm putting them uh, parallel to my seam line so I can kind of gauge like how I want the pants to fit. Now, once I have all my pins in, you can use your chalk or your fabric marker to just draw a line, the line um, where the pin marks are. So it makes it easier for when you're sewing it on your sewing machine. And then I just do a quick basting stitch. So once I have that done, I can turn them back right side out. I could try them on, see if it looks okay, if I wanna do something different. With the basting stitch, it's pretty much easy to take out and redo it again. Now, once I have that one leg where it's looking how I want it to look, then I can go ahead flip it back wrong side out. I can measure along where my basting line is compared to where the old edge of the seam is. And then I can transfer that to the other pant legs. So that way they'll be equal. It's hard to do with pants because you definitely want to make sure it's equal, but nobody's going to know if there's little variations. We'll keep everybody's secret here. But yeah, so that's how I do it. Um, there are probably maybe easier ways to do it, but it, I find that just works for me and it's easier for me to eyeball how I want it to look. Okay, um, let's see, Jane Lindley, my rayon Chalie 
uh, blouses always have gaping necklines. What's the best way to stabilize without changing the fabric too much? All right, so this sounds like, I don't know if it's a, a fit issue. It could be a fit issue and not necessarily um, the fabric, but definitely with any type of blouse, you definitely want to have some sort of um, stabilizer. Either it, you can use bias tape in order to stabilize the neckline or you just want to use a facing. But if, if it's only happening with that type of fabric, then it might not be a fit issue. It may just be the fabric itself. Um, yeah, I would be interested to know if it's, if you're having the issue with other fabrics as well. So maybe you can just send me a follow-up and that would kind of give me a, a better idea. So in the meantime, let me just take this other question. Um, can you give an idea how to reuse baby frocks in new shirts or something as have many pretty printed frocks and fancy dresses for my girls? So a lot of people have um, wanting, a lot of people want suggestions in order how to uh, redo something. I actually had a question from somebody who said, um, I'm getting married, I don't really know how to sew, but my, I wanna take my mom's wedding dress and incorporate it into my new wedding dress and all that kind of stuff. So you definitely wanna know where your skill level is and what you're comfortable in doing. And I feel like the safest suggestion is don't feel like you need to take one garment and completely alter it and to make it a completely new garment. If you don't feel bad about destroying the original garment, you can take bits and pieces of it and just incorporate that just to make it a little bit easier on yourself. For instance, if you have a baby outfit that you wanna create a, a new top for your you know, two-year-old kid now, maybe you're just taking portions of it and you're just transferring the yoke. So you're cutting the first garment in order to create the yoke for the next one or the sleeves or something smaller. So you can incorporate new fabric with old fabric and kind of recycling a little bit. Um, if it has trim on it, you can transfer the trim. But there's other creative ideas that you can do with your original garments if you kind of want to hold on to some memory of it, which is taking out squares of it and making a quilt. Or if there's a really cool embroidery or trim element on it, you can cut it out, put it in an embroidery hoop, and put it on your wall just to kind of decorate. It's just how creative do you want to get. If you have a daughter that has a favorite doll, you can you know, take some of that fabric and put it into her new garment as the yoke or the ruffle at the bottom or whatever, and then take a portion of the original um, garment and then make a matching dress for her doll or something like that. So there are different ways that you can use it. Just don't look at it as trying to take the whole thing, but bits and pieces of it. And I think that makes it a little bit easier and less intimidating. Okay, let's see. Um... Are you self-taught self or did you go to school from Marion? I am both. I learned how to sew um, through high school. I was in the sewing class for a couple of years. I did like beginning sewing and then advanced sewing and then I did like costume sewing, which I created clothes for my school's performances and stuff like that. So I learned through that. Um, it wasn't very easy because there was basically one teacher and there was, I don't know, over 20 students. So basically my learning is the teacher would say, go to the fabric store, pick out your pattern, pick out your fabric. And my mom knew how to sew. So that part was easy because at least I had someone there to help me with that stage of it. But then you would get to school and basically everybody was on their own and you just basically had to work through the pattern yourself. And if you got stuck, you would have to go write your name on the board, wait for the teacher to come to your name. She would come to you, help you with that one step, and then she'd move on to the next student. But of course, not knowing how to sew, you'd then get to the next step, and then I'd have to go write my name on the board again and wait. So I spent a lot of time trying to figure it out myself, waiting for her to help me, and then just sitting there playing with my pin cushion. So I would probably say, I wasn't very confident when I got out of high school in my sewing abilities and stuff because I really wasn't able to get through that many projects. 
it didn't stop me from applying and getting a job at a fabric store, but I also learned a lot through that because there I was dealing, I was working with ladies who did a lot of quilting or did other crafts and just me being around that environment, I was learning from them as they were answering questions from other people and stuff like that. And then once I got out of uh, college, I went on to um, basically doing video production and stuff like that. And I just kind of treated sewing as a hobby. But as I did it more and more, I definitely learned a lot more um, different techniques and becoming more confident and actually trying to tackle a zipper and all that kind of stuff. So. I would probably say I'm more self-taught than school taught, but you know, sometimes you just gotta jump in and take a chance and that's probably how you learn is through your mistakes. All right, um, Laura asked, I have problems sewing knit fabrics with a standard domestic machine. My problems are not only with hems, but all seams. Maybe you can teach us how to solve it, please. So yes, I know there are a lot of problems with knit fabric. I definitely, when I was learning how to sew, knit was something that definitely scared me. Um, and I would have to say probably for this particular issue, not all sewing machines are created equal. So if you are having problems with one particular fabric, it could just be your sewing machine. And you may wanna, especially if you wanna work with knit, like I said, there's all different types of knit. You might want to try working with an interlock knit first if you're just trying to get comfortable working with knits because it's a little thicker. It's a little, I find it to be a lot easier to sew with than working with something like Jersey knit or something that's more lightweight. But if you find that you really want to get into sewing with knit fabrics, um, you definitely want to invest in a machine that can handle it. So if you feel like your sewing machine is only having trouble with that particular type of fabric, it's probably your sewing machine. And also, you know, you definitely want to take your machine in to be serviced at least once a year. So that could be the issue as well. It also could be with the needle. It definitely needs to be a ballpoint needle and it could also be foot pressure. So there's a bunch of different issues. You don't say specifically on what your issue is. But um, yeah, if you want to get into it, definitely look into a machine that's a little bit higher quality for dealing that, with that. Um, let's see. So Teresa wants to know, do you plan on doing any commercial dress pattern tutorials in the future? I know a lot of people um, really like when we do the tutorials on uh, commercial patterns, which we haven't done in a while. And I actually do like doing those tutorials as well. The problem is, is they take a, a long time to actually produce those videos because there's usually so many steps and it's so involved in everything. And the, 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 the biggest issue is that we want to make sure we're doing it in cooperation with the pattern company. So whenever we have anything in our video, it's always in cooperation with that particular company, such as Spiegel, we're always working with them and making sure they're involved in stuff. So it's not just us, or it's not just me just running down to the fabric store and grabbing a pattern and making sure, you know, that we cover it. It's just that we're actually working with that particular company. And at the moment, we're not working with any of those companies. So why I would like to do that, um, we just not doing it at the moment. But if you're an independent pattern company, definitely feel free to reach out to us because we're definitely open to working with you know different companies and doing different things because I think they're fun too. I like them as well. Okay, let's I'm gonna scroll down here so I can actually read this next question. All right. So uh, Sheree wants to know: Is there any good sewing books you can recommend from beginner to advanced sewing? So I do have a stack of uh, sewing books here and I do reference a lot of books. Now all my books, I have to be honest, are secondhand books. I love going to thrift stores and antique stores and everything like that. So pretty much all my sewing books are not the most recent ones or anything. But if you are learning how to sew and you just want a book, I think you could probably look at any of the major pattern companies or sewing machine companies they just put out a, just a general sewing book as a reference and the one that i have here is the vogue sewing book so this is just if you want to have like an encyclopedia of sewing 
basic learning what techniques are and you can reference it easily that's probably the best way that you can go about it now this one is from the 70s so there may be stuff that's a little old-fashioned but they do update their books with more recent techniques and you could probably find the Vogue, the Vogue sewing book um, that's been published within the last few years. So it'll definitely be more handy for you. Now, that's for beginners. If you want to get more into pattern making, that sort of thing, I do have this one that I really like, which is the Pattern Making Primer. This one is a really good one to have. And I think I actually bought this one new because I was looking through it and I'm like, ooh, this is really good. So I really like those two good books. And then the one that I have is probably my favorite antique book that I have was in the, from the 40s, How to Design Beautiful Clothes. This one has a lot of math in it because it's basically all pattern drafting. And for me, I just find that really easy to kind of follow along because all pattern drafting is math and measurements and stuff like that. So it breaks it down really easily for me. And you can probably only get that book on, I don't know, Craigslist, Etsy, eBay, that kind of stuff. So if you find one, pick it up though, because I love it. And I think it's a really beautifully illustrated book. But for me as a beginner, the best way to learn is just to jump in and it's scary and I know it's scary, but sometimes you just have to do it and just experiment. Buy cheap fabric, go buy muslin, stuff that you don't care about. Go buy, go to the thrift store just to pick up clothes that you can alter and fool around with because that's really the best way to learn instead of just thinking you can read an encyclopedia and you're gonna store all that information. At least that's how it works for me. I mean, if I just stuck with what I was comfortable, then all the clothes that I would make would still have elastic waist pants and waistline pants because that's all I was comfortable doing. I was so afraid of doing buttons and zippers and all that kind of stuff. But then once you do it, you find out that it's really not that intimidating. And it's, you probably build it up in your mind and it's not as scary as you think. So let's see. Um, all right, so James said that it's mostly that fabric that seems to stretch. You know, you might just wanna put a little bit of interfacing even if you don't have the um, facing like a separate facing in there you could probably get like a really really lightweight interfacing that you can just iron to the back of that part of the fabric and see if that helps again just get some cheap fabric that you can experiment with and just apply it to the inside and see if that helps if it's stretching also make sure that you're doing a stay stitch before you even start um, doing the construction of it because sometimes because necklines are curved as you're working with it and sewing with it it can stretch as you're doing it and that kind of makes it more get misshapen because you have to think like things that are cut on a bias they're going to stretch and if you have something that's a curve then that's kind of technically on a bias as well at least parts of it are so, so it can stretch as well so you want to do a stay stitch you want to have some sort of facing or bias tape or something on that neckline in order to hold it um, you can also probably use stay tape along the neckline. Maybe that'll keep it from stretching as well. So I would try all those things and see if you have any better luck with it. Okay, let's see. Um, so subscribe now. Hi there, Professor. I'm completely new to sewing and I want to know if you can teach us how to make underwear, which is very expensive over time. I tried knit, jersey knit, no luck. Yeah, uh, we've only done one tutorial on making panties, um, and I think it might be part of our premium site. Um, like making stuff like bras and stuff like that, it's really not something that I'm completely comfortable with. I don't have a lot of experience in that but I do know there are people that kind of specialize in that. So you can probably find some classes um, online for helping you to do that. I just don't feel comfortable kind of going through all that. So yeah, that's maybe, like I said, you gotta jump into stuff you're not comfortable with. So maybe that's something that I definitely need to, need to get into it as, as well myself. So if I do get super good at it, then I'll definitely try to have a tutorial on it. Um, 
So here's another question. Hi there, would you can please consider doing a tutorial on making a blazer? I would definitely like to do a tutorial making a blazer. Kind of right now what we're doing is doing tutorials that kind of take different parts of a garment instead of doing a whole garment. Like I said, when we do a whole garment, it's usually, it takes a while for us to actually produce that video. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. So if I do parts of it, like, oh, maybe we'll have a tutorial on how to do a lapel or doing a lining for a jacket or something like that. So it's a little bit easier if you're just stuck on one part of a blazer instead of having to go through the whole thing. That might be something that we can definitely uh, take care of in the future. And I'm definitely open to it. I would definitely like to have um, a tutorial making a blazer or a jacket or something like that because, you know, I like wearing jackets. So I would definitely like to do it for myself. I find that a lot of my tutorials are inspired of what am I making that I need? Oh, let's go ahead and do a tutorial for it. So um, yeah, I'm definitely open to it. We'll see. I mean, we still have this year left and then we have all next year and I haven't I haven't planned the tutorials we're doing next year. I just have kind of have it scheduled for the end of this year, but you never know. So I'm always open to suggestions. If you have a suggestion, you can always leave a comment or something like that. And we'll take a look and see, you know, what's plausible and stuff. All right. So just let me see if I missed any questions. Wait, you got my mouse? Okay. We're sharing the, the mouse here. So <laughs> It makes it a little difficult. Just give me a second. I think. Oh, okay. I did miss one. Do you have any experience with production of wanting to mass produce to multiple clients? I do not. I sew for myself, so I'm really not that experienced with starting a, a clothing business or anything like that. I'm definitely not a resource uh, for that, so I can't help you there. I'm sorry. Okay. I do a lot of patterns and a lot of pattern hacking. I want to make the leap to draping. What has your experience with draping been? I've actually taken a few um, lessons on draping, but definitely not to feel like I'm an experienced person at doing draping and stuff. So I can't really answer any questions on draping. Um, so I'm sorry about that. I did enjoy the little bit of lessons that I did have. So it was definitely a new experience, but for me it's, I basically did the basic shell and stuff like that. I didn't really do any of the fun stuff where you're just laying fabric on and pinning it every which way and stuff. It was more like, this is how you create a structured bodice and you have to draw the lines going across, you know, all the horizontal lines. And so it was really basic what I did. Um, can you do a tutorial on how to make pin cushions? We actually did a tutorial on one pin cushion, I believe, and it was doing a little box camera pin cushion and um, the Rubik's Cube pin cushion. So if you go to our website and you just type in pin cushion, you can find that. But basically, you can do a pin cushion any size or shape that you want. You can just get really creative. The, the only thing that I did with mine is I just created the basic shape and then I filled it with um, sand, like sand you get for hermit's crabs or whatever and then you fill it with that to give it kind of some weight and for you to be able to stick your pins in and stuff like that. You can use regular polyfill stuffing as well, but it's really lightweight and it's probably not like an authentic pin cushion, but using that kind of clean sand, it make, definitely makes it a little bit easier to do it. But yeah, I mean, really any, you could just do a ball if you want, you can do something flat. A pin cushion can be any shape that you want. You can make those little bracelets if you want as well. So we may have another tutorial for a pin cushion. I think it would kind of be fun to do it since we did that one, I don't know, like five years ago or something like that. It's weird when you go back and we look at our old videos and it's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but I mean, you gotta, gotta grow and just take it and be like, I was learning too. I was learning how to do these tutorials and I wasn't really that great. 
All right, so what is your best advice for sewing on uniform patches? It was a long time ago when I actually belonged to a group where we had patches. So I haven't had to sew like regular uniform patches, but I don't know if they come with the, the fusible in the back these days, but if they don't, you can just buy some fusible webbing and put it on the back of those before you kind of iron it onto whatever you need to iron it on first, just to kind of hold it so you don't have to like try to stick pins it in and stuff. Or you can get um, fabric tape as well to just kind of hold it. And then I would, if it was me, I would just try to sew it with a sewing machine. I mean, you don't have to do just a regular straight stitch. You can do a zigzag stitch that just goes along the edge. I probably wouldn't sew it by hand just because those things tend to be really thick and that's probably gonna do a number to your fingers. But I don't know, you might be able to take it to one of those, uh, like a place that does alterations and stuff, like a dry clean and stuff, and they might be able to do it for a couple of bucks if your sewing machine can't handle it. A lot of sewing machines, um, regular home sewing machines, they can't handle sewing through really thick fabric and you really don't wanna force your machine to do it if it can't handle that. If your machine can handle it, definitely wanna get the really thick denim leather needle so you can get through the patch and get through your fabric and stuff. But yeah, some, I mean, sometimes if you're paying a couple of bucks and you're just having the dry cleaner do it, it might be worth doing it that way rather than trying to put the strain on your regular home sewing machine. Um, so we have this question, can you make a tutorial on a sailor collar? I don't know, I think that would be kind of fun. Maybe. Um, I would have to get a pattern that actually has that or create my own. So it's definitely a possibility. Um, like I said, I don't know what we're doing for next year, but I have to start creating my schedule soon. So I think it would be kind of cute doing a sailor collar. I like that idea. Um, okay. So Michelle wants to know, do you have, do you recommend, what do you recommend for an upcoming designer? Like, should I go ahead as I feel comfy as a designer, although I haven't done a hands-on schooling? Okay, so I'm taking that you want to become a designer and you want to know like what you should do if you, I'm having a little trouble um, understanding this question, but yeah, I mean, if you want to become a designer, yeah, yes, they have schools for that. The schools are gonna be very expensive if you can't afford it, just go ahead and do it on your own. You can go ahead and design what you want. Maybe uh, try to get friends and family to enlist your services. Now, I would not recommend just doing stuff for free um, because people tend to get, if you offer to do something for free, people tend to kind of take advantage of that, especially if you're on the crafty side. But definitely volunteer your services. And even if you charge you know, $10, $20, whatever, at least you're charging something. It kind of stops people from thinking, oh, if I just buy your fabric, then I don't have to ever pay you anything. You definitely always try to put value to your work. Yes, you're trying to get experience and you're trying to learn, um, but you should also get some money for that as well. Now, if you're just starting to learn how to sew, you definitely don't want to push yourself saying, okay, oh, I'm going to design your whole wedding dress or whatever. You don't want to get involved in all that. But just start with small things and kind of build up your portfolio that way. Now, I'm not a designer. I'm just, I just sew. Um, so there's probably somebody that you can talk to that's going to know more about this. But all I'm saying is if whether you can get in school or you can't get in school, you can start whenever you can go to the thrift store and buy stuff to experiment on so you can get more comfortable making alterations because once you kind of understand garment construction in general and you feel more comfortable tearing garments apart and doing your own designs, sewing however you wanna sew, then you start building up your confidence to start creating your own designs. So I definitely feel that for me, once I finished learning how to learn with commercial patterns, and starting to get into my own, um, creating my own patterns, I definitely felt more confident because I already understood how the construction worked and I already understood how garments go together and stuff like that. So 
all it is is just building up your confidence. And when I took a few classes in pattern making, and this was years and years ago, I was the only person in my class that actually knew how to sew. Like everybody else in my class was taking pattern development and they didn't have any experience with sewing. And I definitely moved at an accelerated rate to all those other people because they didn't understand the two dimensional shapes of what a pattern looks like. But I had because I had been dealing with them for so long. So yes, you can become a designer without learning how to sew, but I definitely feel like it gives you an edge because you already have that knowledge. So I definitely recommend getting as much sewing as you can, but then you can also do your own designing and stuff on top of that. And I just think it, it's easier if you kind of experiment with garments that are already made, like thrift store clothes and stuff like that. All right, let's see here. In the future, will you consider making tutorials slowly or solely with the serger? I definitely want to plan on making some tutorials with a serger. Um, the only thing is when I come up, let's say for example, oh, I'm gonna do a tablecloth or something like that. With a serger, it's, it's almost like it can't only be done with a serger, it can also be done with a sewing machine. So that's why I kind of do most of my projects with a sewing machine, because anything that could be done with a sewing machine can definitely be done with a serger. And I don't want people to feel like, oh, this can only be done with a serger because Professor Pincushion is using a serger for this particular project. So that's why I haven't done it at this point. I haven't really come up with any ideas besides just basic serger videos, like dealing with tension and that kind of stuff. Um, that can only be done with the surgeons kind of in that wheelhouse instead of being more universal. And I just feel like when I'm doing a project, the sewing machine is a little bit more universal and saying this is basically a project that just has to do with sewing and not with a particular tool. So that's why I haven't done it, but I definitely am open to um, doing some serger tutorials. All right, let's see. Each time I change the bobbin, the bobbin casing wants to fall out of the machine when I start sewing and I put in again and it finally stays. What am I doing wrong? So I'm imagining it's a front loading um, bobbin that it, so the bobbin goes into that little casing and you pop it in. Um, I don't know what's going on. You might want to take your sewing machine to a sewing machine repair, like a sew and back shop and just have them take a look at it. But you say it and it finally stays the second time. So I don't know why it's a first thing. You definitely want to make sure when you, you pop it in there, you kind of hear that click. So that makes, that means that it's really secure in there. Um, but I don't know why it would only fall out part of the time. So there could be something wrong. You might want to just get your machine to to look at it and get some maintenance and stuff like that. All right, advice on overcoming anxiety and security when sewing for other people. Mm, I don't think I'm the best person to answer this question because I have anxiety like all the time. So um, yeah, I don't like sewing for other people either. And I do have that fear that I'm going to screw something up so bad that, you know, I for me, I think, when people ask for me to do something, I'm very particular on who I actually accept. So it's more of a question of learning how to say no to people. If you don't feel comfortable that they're gonna not put a lot of pressure on you to um, come up with something either really fast or really good or something like that. So obviously if someone comes up to me and says, you know, will you make a wedding dress for me? I'm gonna say no, I'm not comfortable with that. So. That's really the best advice I can give. Learn how to say no. If you really don't feel comfortable, then just say that and say, I don't feel comfortable taking on this type of a project for you. You know, maybe you want to enlist a professional seamstress or something like that and only take on things that you do feel comfortable doing. If you're just doing little repairs and stuff like that, uh, I definitely feel okay doing that because it's a repair. So it's already, it's already kind of broken. I mean, how, can, how am I going to make it worse, right? But really, the, the more experience you get at doing something, the more confident you're gonna feel at doing something over and over again. And even when you get other people coming up to you, like I, you know, my friends come up and say, can you take this in for me or can you hem this? Well, I've done it a lot, so I feel a little bit more comfortable doing it. And also, 
don't be afraid of doing basting because basting is a temporary thing that you can look at See if it looks good. If it looks good, then you then you do your permanent stitch over it. If not, then you just take it out and you're not ruining anything. So that's what I would say with that. Okay, let's see. Joy says, I have a hard time sewing clothes for myself, mainly when I have to check sizing. I don't have a body form and I can't afford one at this time. Any suggestion or creative tips? Um, yes, I actually do have a suggestion because there are actually a lot of tutorials out there for making your own dress form. I haven't done the a tutorial for this, so I can't recommend any of my videos, but there are tutorials out there where you can, we have to enlist a friend, like put duct tape around yourself and then you cut it off and then you can stuff it. And then you have your own dress form based on your size. Now, if you go and buy a dress form, like you see on the TV shows where it's a really nice professional dress form and it's to the person's size and everything. Those are really, I try to get one myself and it's really expensive. You can get the adjustable ones. Those will probably cost you at least like $100, $150, I think. It's been a long time since I priced those. But if you can't afford that, then yes, definitely you can try to make your own and it might be a, fr a fun way to spend your afternoon. I haven't tried it yet. I have the adjustable one, but yeah, that could be a way to kind of get around it. And then you can just get a wooden dowel or something to kind of pop, pop it on and stuff like that. So you can actually use it, but you definitely, maybe instead of using polyfill, you might want to use your fabric straps just to kind of make it more solid. So it doesn't just fold onto itself. I haven't made one, so I don't know how, how easy it is to, um, to actually put clothes on it and stuff like that. But that's an example. So I would search for making your own dress form, you DIY it, and let me know if it works out for you. Okay, let's see. Um, let's see. Okay. Prophetic win forever. What is your advice for those of us who is new to the sewing world? I'm a beginner and have made two skirts and a dress. Well, you definitely did more than I did when my first sewing class. I think I made a pair of pajama shorts and then I made some corduroy pants because it had an elastic waistline and I was scared to do anything that didn't have elastic in it which also meant that I did a matching scrunchie with my leftover fabric. That was just a thing. If you had leftover fabric, you made a matching scrunchie to go with it and I'm aging myself. But anyways, yes, it is scary. I know it is scary because I have been there and that's my best advice is just to go ahead and jump into it and just to do whatever you want and don't put any pressure on yourself. I wouldn't go to the fabric store and just pick up a really fancy dress because you really like it and it's, you have to start small. And that means going ahead, buying cheap fabric, maybe just picking a pattern because, because it has a zipper in it and you wanna try to do a zipper. Or you can watch our tutorial on how to put in a zipper and just use a scrap of fabric just so you get comfortable doing it without having to actually put it in, in something. And I know it's difficult because it's easy to get excited looking through the pattern lookbooks and saying like, I want to make all these great things. I don't want to make this boring, whatever vest with buttons. But sometimes that's how you learn is just by doing stuff over and over again. And even if it's boring, but like I said, if you don't want to make a whole outfit and you just want to learn techniques, you can watch our tutorials. You can just experiment on a little scrap of fabric putting in a zipper, putting in buttonholes, putting on buttons, that kind of thing. And that will definitely make it feel more comfortable once you do jump in and you go with those bigger projects and you use that more expensive fabric. There's nothing like having the pressure of putting a deadline on yourself, which I used to do because I would get into that, that rut where I'd be like, I really want to wear this new dress that I made and I have to finish it tomorrow. Now I'm staying up all night to get it all done and driving myself nuts and stuff like that. And I spend a lot of money on this fabric and I don't want to ruin it. So when you start putting that type of pressure on yourself, that's, well, for me, that's when the anxiety starts and everything like that. So 
just take a breath, you know, treat it as a hobby, do what you want to do. I think it'll probably make the learning a lot more fun and a lot easier. Oh, and I just want to say, I've been seeing the comments that you guys have been leaving, just thanking for our tutorials and I really do appreciate it. And it really means a lot. We've been doing this for many years now and sometimes you get bogged down in just creating tutorials. So it's nice when you're able to come up for breath and you see that people are learning from your tutorials and people do appreciate it. And it really means a lot to us because we've been doing this for a long time. So it's nice to know that people are actually appreciating and learning with us and I'm still learning too. So whenever I learn a new thing and I get really excited and it, it, sometimes it comes from my books, like my Vogue book from the 70s and I, and I say, I've never even heard of this technique before. This is really cool. And then I want to share it with you guys. So I'm glad that you like it. All right, let's see if we have another question. Um, let's see here. Oh, okay. So Teresa wants to know, did you make a follow-up assembly video for use your existing tops to create new patterns? I could not find it. Um, well, we did a couple of those tutorials. Now we have the basic one, which is basically a t-shirt and a tank top. So I believe we do have a tutorial on just doing a basic tank top. I am not really sure, but it's probably part of our premium um, tutorial side. And then the other one, we don't have a tutorial on actually sewing it together, which is the, the more advanced um, existing tops just because I use several different tops in that example and I was just using some of the elements you might find such as doing um, tucks and doing darts and stuff like that so we don't have a follow-up tutorial to that particular video um, just because I wasn't focusing on one top I was just doing different elements that you may come across when you're trying to uh, recreate those top or create patterns for those tops um, okay, Michelle wants to know, can you make a tutorial on pattern making? And I saw somebody else said, um, I was interested in doing a tutorial or was interested in seeing a tutorial for doing a bodice and on our website for our premium, we do have some basic tutorials on pattern making. So we have the bodice block. So which so when you take your pattern and you bring it back down to its most basic element, that's going to be a block. So it's just a basic bodice. And then from that, you can do different variations. So we have that. And then I show you how to do princess seams and do the sweetheart pattern from that. Um, we also have different collars. So there are tutorials for making patterns for the collars. Um, we do sleeves, we do a t-shirt. Uh, we have pants, we have skirts. So there are actually quite a few um, basic patterns that you can create with our tutorials, but it's on our website. So you'd have to go to professorpincushion.com and then search our premium videos and then you'll see them there. Okay, let's see. All right, cat lover one, two, three. Are you planning on making any more Dear Professor Pincushion videos? We have thought about doing that. Um, they're definitely more difficult to put together than just a regular tutorial um, because then I got to think of a subject and I got to write it and then got to try to be funny about it and that's not always easy. So we'll see. I don't know. Maybe you guys can provide me with some inspiration of some of your funny sewing stories and we can just have a Dear Professor Pincushion. This is how I screwed up the top I was making or something like that. So I think that might be kind of fun. I don't know, you guys give me some ideas and we'll see what we can do. All right, Becky Shirley, do you have a bed skirt tutorial? I do not have a tutorial on how to make a bed skirt, but you never know, we'll see. So yeah, you guys just keep ideas coming and we'll just keep you know, making as many tutorials as we can. I think at this point we've, been doing it for 
I don't know, I want to say eight years and we have over 400 tutorials. So we've done a lot and sometimes it does get to the point where you're thinking, what else can I make a tutorial on? But there's still a lot of ideas and when we hear from you guys, it definitely helps to inspire what those tutorials are going to be about. All right, uh, Simon, do you have any favorite fabrics to work with? Um, probably my favorite fabric to work with, and it's embarrassing to say, but it's just because I've been sewing for so long and it's so stupid. My favorite fabric to work with is felt because it's so easy. And I wish I could just make like everything I wear is made out of felt because it's so easy. But obviously I can't do that. Um, I would probably say working with knit fabric, I found I used to be really scared of and I found it's been a lot easier, especially when you have a machine that you know can handle it and work with it really well. Um, it's probably one of my favorites just because it's so easy to kind of get the fit right and you don't have to worry if it's not perfect and stuff like that. And it also doesn't fray. And if you're sewing with knit, you can do a sort of a zigzag stitch for your seam and then cut right along the edge if you don't have a serger and you don't have to worry about it looking bad or having huge seams and stuff in there. So that's why I like knit. Um, let's see, what other fabric do I like to work with? And cotton's pretty easy. I like fabrics that don't give me any trouble. If the fabric's gonna give me trouble, I don't like working, I don't care what it looks like. If it's something like velvet, yeah, it looks pretty, but then as I'm sewing with it, it's driving me nuts and then I hate it. So that's, that's probably how I rate fabric. So obviously I'm not a designer because for me it's not about looks, it's about how it is to sew with. All right, bandana grandma, what type of knit skim the body instead of clean to the body? Probably the more thicker knits I would think, such as interlock knits because just because they tend to be a little bit thicker and then it also depends on the the pattern uh, how much ease is going to be in it so you're going to have to look at the pattern and see um, what the design ease is built into it so it's a little bit more of a, a looser fit instead of something that's going to be tight if I, I would think that if you have um like a jersey because it's so lightweight, it's probably gonna clean up. But again, it just depends on the design of the of the pattern. Oh, crusty old man beard, thank you. He said he liked my hair. Thank you very much. Um, all right, Kim, Kim Solomon, any V-neck t-shirt videos? I don't know. We do have a V-neck, but it's for woven. It's not for t-shirt. But if you look at our video for doing, I don't remember the, the title of the video, but it may be working with stay tape or something like that. In that video, I'm doing a V-neck on a knit and I'm showing how to use stay tape in order to make sure that you're, you're creating that stabilization in the V. So you might wanna take a look at that video because it would kind of be the same thing. Now, if you're dealing with, oh, I need to put, um, like the binding on a V-neck t-shirt. We don't have a video on that, but that's an idea that we can definitely do for upcoming videos, which I think is probably a good idea just because, you know, we haven't done something like that and it would be something different. All right, uh, Kim also asks, how do you avoid puckering in knit? That is definitely having to do, again, with the, the type of knit, which, which types tend to have that happen more often. Um, so you have to provide usually stabilization. It could also be thread tension and bobbin tension, that kind of thing. But if you've done all that and it's still kind of wavy as you're sewing, then you need to provide some stabilization. And again, what I do is I just grab regular old tissue paper, I put it behind my fabric as I'm sewing, and then I sew on top of that. And that seems to help. And then when I finish, I just tear off the paper. So that's what I do. That's my trick. And you can also, again, if it's um, washable, you can just spray a little spray starch on there and keep it flat. Because all you're just trying to do is keep it flat as you're sewing it. 
if, if you're sewing it and it's starting to make those waves, it's really hard to get that out even after you, you know, you try stretching it and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes you still get a little bit of that, but if it stays flat as it sews, then it's going to be like that even after you wash the spray starch out or you take off the, the tissue paper and stuff like that. So that's how I get around it. There's just some fabrics that is like, no matter what you do, they're going to give you issues. So you just try all these different little tricks and just see what works for you. <clears throat> okay. Um, the Pamster, do you have any vintage all metal machines? And if not, have you ever used one? I love mine. I do have one. I got a couple years ago from my mom. She got me a Singer Featherweight. So it's a little tiny. Uh, singer machine and I've only sewn on it a few times I thought of maybe uh, doing a video where I just try to sew with some of my vintage patterns on my vintage machine and just see what happens so maybe it'll make an appearance someday I don't know I don't know if that's something that you guys would actually be interested in just I'm not actually showing you how to do something I'm just sewing on my old machine doing my old patterns or something like that so we'll see we have some ideas but we'll see what we actually get around to doing all right uh cat lover one two three i've had some trouble with cutting my rotary cutter i found that i have to press really hard to get it to cut when i'm trying to cut and even then it misses spots is that normal um i don't know if it's normal but i will say that it has happened to me um, so you're not alone. It does. Ha I, I don't know in my case if I'm just not pressing down hard enough and it also depends on how many layers you're trying to get through. I get greedy sometimes. I'm like, I'm going to go through 10 layers because I only want to do this once. And then I run into issues because it doesn't cut through all the layers. So it could be layers. It could be the type of fabric. It could be your blades not sharp enough. So you can buy replacement blades. You can also buy the the blade sharpener although i haven't used those so i don't know how well they work i just normally just get a replacement blade when i feel like i need it but i'm sure they have a certain number of cuts that they're good for and then they start going dull in some issues and also make sure that you're only cutting fabric on your mat and not cutting other things with them because if they hit your plastic ruler or whatever i don't know it could probably damage and get nicks and when that comes around when you're cutting through the fabric maybe that's what's causing causing the gap but if you're using a new blade then usually it tends to work a lot better than if I've had the blade for a while so I don't know maybe somebody else can answer I don't know what the secret is either because it happens to me sometimes too um all right 1954 B John does Bernina make the best machines I cannot say because I have not used every single machine out there. I do know that Bernina definitely makes really good machines, but there are a lot of good machines out there. So I think it's just like with cars. People just have their preference and you're just going to use whatever machine makes you feel most comfortable. So if you like Bernina, stick with Bernina. Okay. Um, Geraldine, have you heard of UI, USIBG? school glue to hold fabric together while sewing it washes out i have not heard that but if it's a good trick then maybe i will try it because as long as it doesn't leave any residue then i don't see what the problem is i am not a stickler for you only have to sew, sew a certain way and if you don't do something in a particular way then you're not a real sewer or whatever i'm the type of person like whatever works works and that's just what i do all right, Simon Schaefer, do you have a favorite sewing machine? I don't necessarily have a favorite sewing machine. Whatever sewing machine is currently working and not giving me issues, that is my favorite sewing machine. And machines give me issues over all sorts of things. So I sometimes I jump around from machine to machine. Like one machine's not working, so then I go onto another machine and that's working and that gives me problems and I move on to another machine. Maybe that's why I have so many machines. I don't know. But that's just my opinion. I don't really care. If it's working, then it's working, and that's all I care about. Um, 
Michelle Henry, do you have a suggestion on where to start to teach yourself sewing? I'm trying to, the very first thing that I actually learned to sew, and this was when I was a kid and my mom was trying to teach me how to sew, we would just make these little pillows that have like buttons sewn onto it. It was like nothing. <laughs> really it wasn't really anything that was useful or any sort of thing so that's where I started how to learn and it was all basically hand sewing and everything but if you're looking to actually use a sewing machine you know actually I do I have heard that some public libraries actually offer to loan out things like sewing machines so even if you don't have a sewing machine check with your local library and see if that's something that they offer because then you can at least, you know, learn on something that's not yours and you don't have to put in all that money if you're not willing to, if you don't know if you really want to get into the hobby or not. So you can definitely check that out. Um, obviously on our channel, we have a ton of tutorials from basic techniques to more advanced things. If you want to get into garment sewing, then you can check out some of our tutorials on where we take a commercial pattern and we go step by step through the whole thing. Because at least, you know, you have us kind of holding your hand through each thing instead of like what, what I did in my situation where I just sat around and played with my pin cushion and waiting for someone to come help me on the stuff I was stuck at. So it definitely makes you feel a little bit more confident because I'm showing you each single thing that you need to do as opposed to trying to figure it out on your own. But once you do that, you might feel a little bit more confident in going ahead and picking another pattern. But you can take a local sewing class. Sometimes they have them at your fabric store if you really want to have that person with you, next to you or everything. Um, I mean, there's so many different ways to learn how to sew. You can buy kits. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I don't think they offer it in school anymore. Hmm. I don't know. I say just jump in. Just go onto our channel, find an easy project, and just jump in and do it. I mean, you're not going to learn unless you just do it. Okay. Um. All right. Subscribe now. Professor, my first project was an A-line frock. I bought it from Simplicity Joint Fabric, three-year-old toddler, and made so many mistakes. Do you start over from scratch or do you keep going? Um, I would probably, I've made mistakes. I've definitely made a ton of mistakes and I don't think I've ever started over on anything. I always just kept going and I don't know. I mean, maybe it didn't turn out so great in the end like I imagined. I always get excited at the beginning of the project because I imagine the most beautiful thing that it could be. And then as I'm going through it, I get more and more disappointed because it's not really living up to that thing. So don't put so much pressure on yourself because my stuff doesn't always turn out all the time either. But I just keep going. And if you're really a stickler, like I said, do basting stitches, check it out, see how it looks, and then go ahead and do your permanent stitch. I mean, there's no race to get it done in a certain amount of time because usually when that happens, that's when, that's when you start making, making mistakes and everything like that. So I guess it's just up to you. I just keep going and try to make everything look as good as possible. And I know I get comments sometimes where people are looking at our videos and they're saying, oh, well, you're, you know, your seam's not that straight. I just want to point out for the record <laughs> that the, the camera has the best angle at my sewing machine than I do. I'm usually like off to the side, trying to barely get my hand in there as I'm sewing it. And that's usually why everything looks crooked on camera doing the best I can, people. <laughs> All right, let's see. Margie Jarvis wants to know, how many sewing machines do you have? I am counting in my head. I think I have five right now. Definitely not as much as my mom. She has like 20. 
I only have five, so I have a long ways to go. All right. <clears throat> um, I don't see any more questions. Let me think. Let me just peruse through this real fast to make sure I haven't missed out on anyone. Oh, this person, Bandana Grandma. I think it is Janelle who makes a model treadle machine. I was thinking of using one at craft fairs where there's no power. Have you tried one? I have not tried one. I did not know there was a modern treadle machine. That is really cool. I'll have to take a look online to see what it actually looks like. And it's probably a really good workout too. I wonder how fast it can go. Yeah, I don't know anything about those machines. So if you use one and it works great, let me know because I would definitely be interested and I don't want to buy another machine because I think I have enough as it is. Oh, review says it's really hard to treadle. Well, there you go. Good exercise, hard to treadle. Maybe not necessarily that great to sew with. And like I said, my favorite machine is the one that's not giving me any problems. Well, it's now 1.10 and I'm starting to lose my voice. So I think we are going to end this, but I wanna thank everyone who joined in for my live stream, which I know I'm not that great at doing things live, but I've been really trying to answer everyone's questions and I really appreciate you guys leaving us nice comments and joining in and watching our videos. And if you don't subscribe to our channel, definitely please subscribe and click that little bell icon so if we ever do go live again or we have a new video and stuff you'll definitely be notified so thank you so much and thank you for watching and i will talk to you guys later thanks bye